Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jess Peak, and I'm the director of the International and Comparative Law Program and the assistant director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights at UCLA School of Law. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this event on the Biden administration and international law. And I'd particularly like to welcome the new UCLA law admitted students that are joining this webinar. Hopefully this event will give you an insight into the faculty and expertise you can benefit from when you join us here at the law school. This event was organized by the International and Comparative Law Program and is co-sponsored by the Berkle Center for International Relations and the Promise Institute for Human Rights. Thank you very much to all of those involved. So our new US President Joe Biden and his administration face some significant challenges in international relations. And this is what we're going to be discussing in this panel today. The four years of the Trump administration were characterized really by disrupting international policies and our relationships with other states. President Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement and from the Iran nuclear deal. He withdrew from the UN Human Rights Council and severed the US's relationship with the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic. President Trump imposed trade tariffs on China, withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and renegotiated NAFTA, which is now known as the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement. President Trump also created friction with the leaders of several of our traditional allies, including Germany, Canada and the United States. And he developed closer ties with leaders who have traditionally been our enemies. For example, meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in Vietnam and Singapore. President Trump accelerated the withdrawal of our military troops from Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And he also pardoned military contractors convicted of crimes in Afghanistan and intervened in court martials of service members accused of war crimes. The Trump administration elevated its opposition to the International Criminal Court, leading to the imposition of sanctions against the prosecutor and one of her senior leadership team. And all of these issues are things we will be discussing in this webinar today. And I'm delighted that we have four UCLA law faculty members who will be able to address these and other issues and challenges that President Biden will face as he begins his term. So what we're gonna do is I will briefly introduce each of our panelists who will then give five to seven minutes of opening remarks. After that, we'll transition to a more uh, discursive question and answer format. Some people did submit questions in advance via the RSVP form, so thanks for those. For others in our audience, please use the Zoom Q&A function to ask your questions. So who is on our panel? Asla Bali is a professor of law at the, at the law school and the faculty director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights. She was previously the director of the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies. Professor Bali's scholarly interests lie in two areas, public international law, including human rights and the law of the international security order, and comparative constitutional law with a focus on the Middle East. Richard Steinberg is the Jonathan D. Varrett Endowed Chair in Law and a Professor of Political Science. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of the award-winning iccforum.com, and he researches, writes, and teaches in the areas of international law and international relations, with a focus on international economic law, international criminal law, and human rights. Alex Wong is a professor of law and a leading expert on environmental governance and the law and the politics of China. His research focuses on the social effects of law and the interaction of law and institutions in China and the United States. Our fourth and final panelist is Carl Rustiala, who will join us shortly. And Professor Rustiala holds the Promise Institute Chair in Comparative and International Law and is the director of the UCLA Ronald W. Burkle Center for International Relations. Professor Rastiala's research focuses on international law, international relations, and intellectual property law. So we have a broad range of expertise here in this panel. Um, we're really excited to share our thoughts with you about the Biden administration and some of the challenges it is going to face. And we really look forward to hearing and responding to your questions on this. So please do put them in the Q&A function. Uh, I will now turn things over to Professor Bali. Great, thanks so much, um, Professor Peek, and thanks, of course, to everyone for joining us and welcome, especially admitted students. Um, in thinking about international law and the Biden administration, I was tasked with addressing the human rights portfolios that the Biden administration will face. Um, 
And I just thought I would start by a little bit of framing. Um, as we saw from uh, President Biden's inaugural address, he devoted very little time to international questions. And this is understandable given the scale of the domestic emergencies he is confronting, the pandemic, um, the consequences of, of the pandemic on the economy, racial injustice, climate crisis, a massive hack of the government uh, that was discovered last fall, and of course the aftermath of an insurrection at the Capitol. And still, despite this, enormous numbers of steps have already been taken in the few short weeks that the Biden administration has been put in, uh, has been in office. And these steps include repairing alliances, rejoining the international community across a, a range of areas, including many that Professor Peake just touched upon, the Paris Accord, rejoining the Paris Accord, re-engaging with the World Health Organization, uh, declaring an uh, intention to return to the UN Human Rights Council, resuming refugee admissions and reversing other immigration and travel restrictions like the so-called Muslim ban, um, uh, negotiating a five-year extension of the New START, U.S.-Russia Arms Control Treaty, working with allies to develop a shared approach to the military coup in Myanmar, reestablishing protections for L LGBTQI communities at home and in our international policies on health and reproductive rights, and um, marking the change in his administration's approach with a major address that he gave uh, last week on February 4th at the State Department entitled America's Place in the World, which emphasized that global issues would be the priority for his administration over great power competition, even as the administration acknowledges real uh, competitive uh, challenges in the international community. So with that basic framing, what might uh, the Biden administration do beyond the steps I've already outlined to repair the US role on human rights? Um, here I would point to three different uh, kinds of strategies. The first is reversing the kinds of attacks on the international human rights law framework that we saw under the Trump administration. And again, some of which was um, already embedded in Professor Peake's remarks. For example, uh, the Trump administration convened a so-called unalienable rights commission to essentially rewrite uh, the American understanding of human rights law. This should just be forthrightly repudiated. Uh, the Biden administration can also recommit to the long-term goal of closing Guantanamo, uh, reimpose restrictions that were um, relaxed or lifted on targeted killing uh, and the use of uh, drones uh, as, as part of that policy under the Biden administration, restore a commitment to the landmine ban, uh, and support to the Saudi war in Yemen, on which I'll say a little bit more in a minute, because that's already been very clearly signaled by the Biden administration, and take some measures at home that would enhance our human rights compliance, including ending uh, the federal death penalty usage, reimposing civil rights oversight on police departments, uh, and withdrawing sanctions against the International Criminal Court, which the administration, again, has already said is under review and likely to happen in the coming days or at most weeks. Besides reversing outright attacks on human rights, uh, the Biden administration could also reaffirm commitment to core human rights protections at home and abroad. This would begin, to my mind, by the administration advancing anti-racism on a global scale by advancing anti-racism at home. And this could entail partnering with individuals like our own uh, Tendai Achumi, a professor here at the law school, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism and Xenophobic Discrimination, and has engaged in pathbreaking work that the United States could embrace to build anti-racist policies uh, regarding everything from the global health pandemic and the international response to it, to the use and regulation of new technologies. In addition, in the area of reforming uh, American commitments to core human rights protections, the Biden administration should commit to areas of protection that were undermined by the Trump administration, including a commitment to media freedoms at home and abroad, freedom of association and assembly, and standing with political opposition figures and human rights defenders rather than autocrats. And here again, the Biden administration has already indicated that it will be moving in this direction with the support that it has voiced for Alexei Navalny, the dissident in Russia who is currently being uh, both prosecuted and persecuted by the Putin government. Finally, the administration will have to re-engage and rebuild beyond the steps I've uh, just outlined. And this is true across the board in international law, but particularly so in human rights, which would mean appointing highly qualified people to the United Nations in New York and Geneva, and more generally rebuilding the diplomatic corps with an increased budget to the State Department and scaling back the use of ambassadorships to reward campaign cont contributors, instead committing to entrusting policy, diplomatic relations, and US international law commitments to seasoned diplomats and international law experts. 
the government should also, under the Biden administration, reestablish the interagency working group on human rights, which once included the National Security Council, but was disbanded under the Trump administration. And beyond reengaging with the Human Rights Council, which again, the Biden administration has already signaled it will do, it should also engage with other UN agencies doing important human rights work, such as UNESCO, uh, the UN Refugee Works Authority, the Population Fund, and again, the International Criminal Court. Beyond these agencies, uh, the Biden administration should also take steps to re-engage with treaty bodies and human rights regional mechanisms, nominating US independent experts to these bodies wherever possible, um, something that the Trump administration uh, failed to do or withdrew from. Finally, the US should extend its current engagement with human rights to recognizing the extraterritorial application of existing human rights obligations by the United States, supporting economic and social rights, and using treaties that we have signed but not ratified, given the challenges with ratification in the Senate, nonetheless using those treaties, such as, for example, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, as a benchmark for the human rights standards that the US recognizes and that guides executive uh, branch policy and action under the Biden administration. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Professor Bali. Uh, Professor Steinberg, can I invite you to speak next? Thank you, Jess. Um, I've been tasked uh, with uh, talking about Biden administration trade policy and law, which I will get to momentarily. I first wanna make a few general points, three general points, and that is that there are several tensions operating uh, on US foreign policy under the Biden administration. Um, the first tension I think is that there will be a radical increase in attempts at cooperation with other countries, but the cooperation will be harder than ever. Uh, Biden is recognized uh, and uh, as has uh, Tony Blinken, his secretary of state, that attempts to cooperate with like-minded countries are needed. Uh, and that is going to be a big break with uh, the Trump administration. U.S. power has continued to decline. Uh, China's power has risen. Uh, the U.S. has the same security commitments, security guarantees that it had in place 75 years ago, but our share of global GDP during that period has fallen from about 75% to less than 25%. We cannot achieve what we used to, and we cannot even successfully uh, uh, maintain our security commitments without cooperation with others. However, the Biden administration is going to face a world less willing to cooperate than at any time in the last 75 years. So we're not going to just see a reversion to Reagan Obama, the Reagan Obama period. Um, we have uh, in the last five years, it has become uh, very apparent that both China and Russia are, are overtly revisionist powers, both in terms of territory and global policy. Um, Japan uh, while it shares many interests with the United States, it's between a rock and a hard place. It is located very close to China. It has to be very careful in uh, how it cooperates with the United States. And most importantly, the European Union, uh, which is uh, uh, really the other uh, uh, great power or, uh, that we can cooperate with, has its own divisions. It saw a face of fascism in the United States. It has seen U.S. growing attention to Asia. Um, it uh, heard uh, uh, from the right wing and, and the Trump administration uh, questioning NATO and, and suggesting the possibility of, of withdrawal. Um, and the European countries are much smaller individually than, of course, uh, the great powers in the world. So they need to have a more multilateral focus. So uh, uh, Frau Merkel has said that she wants uh, to maintain a multilateral policy, not one stacked against, uh, against Russia or against uh, uh, China. Uh, uh, Macron has said that he wants a more independent Europe. So try as the administration might, it will be harder uh, than ever to uh, uh, succeed in deep cooperation with uh, other countries. The second tension is that abiding by rule of law at the international level will again be a guiding principle of U.S. foreign relations, but the U.S. government will face increasing pressure to change certain areas of international law and in some cases to not comply with it. Uh, Secretary of State Blinken is part of the uh, foreign policy establishment in Washington. Uh, before the Trump administration, the State Department was the agency in the federal government that would tell other cabinet agencies and 
tell Capitol Hill that the United States cannot do X, Y, or Z because it violates international law. I expect the State Department will become that agency again. Um, but abiding by international law, complying with it, is going to be increasingly difficult because of uh, uh, a divergence of interest globally, because the substance of a lot of international law is dated, uh, partly because of new technologies uh, that affect things like trade and arms control. Um, and unless those areas can be updated, there'll be pressure to uh, move to a uh, more anarchic uh, world in those areas. Uh, moreover, domestic interests and demands have morphed um, in the last uh, several years, clearly on immigration and clearly on trade. And there is increased foreign breach of international law. And as that occurs, I mean, think, of, think of China in the uh, South China Sea, or Russia, Syria, or Iran seizing vessels. Um, as those kinds of events occur, there's going to be pressure to do what is necessary to respond to them. Um, and that might involve doing things that have, shall we say, a plastic view of many rules of international law. The third tension is that domestic interests and public opinion have morphed in the last four years. So Biden's team faces pressures and constraints that are going to change traditional U.S. foreign policies that have been the norm for decades. This is not going to be the Obama administration redux. Uh, so in trade, uh, we are moving uh, uh, sort of globalization and hyper-liberalization was the policy for um, most of the last uh, uh, 40 years. Um, clearly, we're moving in a more protectionist uh, direction. Um, on China, uh, uh, we have been cooperating with China uh, until the Trump administration for several decades, uh, trying to bring them into the international system on an assumption that they would be a constructive player. We're moving obviously towards more containment and partial decoupling. And in immigration, as a third example, uh, that simply is gonna have to be slowed compared to uh, uh, years before the Trump administration. Uh, that should be clear from domestic US politics. It's also, I think, you know, somewhat clear from the data. In 1970, immigrants constituted 4.7% of the American population. By 2010, it was 12.9%. Um, I, I do think that the um, um, racism and prejudice against migrants is actually rooted in economics, but um, uh, whatever the cause is, uh, immigration, while it will be more humane and compassionate and will be expanded compared to uh, the Trump administration, is going to uh, not revert to the levels we saw uh, in the uh, 2000s and uh, in the uh, uh, Obama administration. Now, on trade policy, exactly what's going to happen is to some degree like, uh, you know, reading tea leaves. We can look at the interests at play and we can um, also look at the personnel involved. Um, the interests at play um, uh, are uh, clearly the Biden administration has brought in people who are much more concerned about uh, labor uh, and the environment uh, than in the Trump administration. And the concern about China is uh, as pronounced, I would say, in this administration as it was in the um, Trump administration. Uh, they are, those groups stand more, more towards this sort of embedded liberal position, a, a one that's more protective of the United States economy than the globalists with uh, which have uh, very high expectations for cooperation with other countries. The US Chamber of Commerce, for example, uh, wants always to, uh, or usually to expand trade uh, and trade opportunities. This is a very different balance from the Reagan to Obama years. Um, it is uh, slightly different from the Trump balance of interests. If one looks at the personnel, the uh, United States trade representative, uh, the appointees in the trade realm, um, they are not likely to make radical changes. They are all from inside the beltway, most from Capitol Hill or from the Obama administration. They range from centrist Democrats to uh, left-leaning Democrats on trade and the environment. The USTR Catherine Tai is a, a brilliant um, uh, lawyer uh, from Capitol Hill, but previously at USTR. She worked on China issues there. Um, she's fluent in Mandarin. She's widely respected. Uh, she's put together an extraordinarily talented group. 
that will catalyze change, but probably won't be radically transformative. Some of the changes from the Trump administration uh, will be more effort to cooperate with the European Union and Japan, but it will that will be very difficult and very slow. Much more attention to labor issues, not only express provisions for labor standards and trade agreements, uh, but more support for the use of trade remedy laws, that is sort of tariff surcharges to uh, uh, protect American jobs. Uh, Pre President Biden has already announced a Buy American Procurement Plan that uh, assures that the government will buy more American goods, uh, again, to help labor and to help business in the United States, though uh, there are, it will be hard to not run afoul of U.S. obligations under a World Trade Organization Agreement on, pro on procurement, procurement. And um, this administration is considering the idea of engaging in industrial policy and, and technology policy. This is sort of implicit in the idea of build back better, right? It implies that the government will have some role in deciding what is built. Um, and uh, uh, on uh, also more, more attention to trade environment issues, such as fisheries, possibly a border carbon tax adjustment in cooperation with the European Union. Um, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, we'll come back to you in the Q&A. Uh, Professor Wong, can I pass things to you? Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm glad to be here and welcome to all of you in the, the audience. So um, I've been asked to talk about two things today. One is uh, how the uh, Biden administration plans to address um, the issue of China and also to talk uh, about uh, Biden administration's attitudes towards uh, the environment, which uh, largely I, I will basically focus on uh, what we've learned so far about how the Biden administration will handle climate change. Uh, so I'm going to start with um, talking about China in general, and that obviously uh, matters to how the administration will handle climate change as well. But um, w we know that relations between the U.S. and China are arguably at the, the lowest point that it's been in, in decades, perhaps since uh, the opening up in the early 70s. Um, the approach to China took a, a more aggressive turn during the Trump administration, um, and uh, from what we've heard so far, it looks like it, it really, the, the whole center towards China within Washington, D.C. has shifted in a more hawkish direction. And we're, we're likely to see the Biden administration continue uh, in that vein and to be more hawkish than past Democratic uh, administrations. But the signals from the administration so far is that uh, they plan to do it uh, better or more effectively, take a different approach than, uh, uh, than what the Trump administration uh, has taken. So what have we heard from the officials, uh, from the administration so far? So uh, straight from the president, uh, the president said uh, in an interview just a few days ago that we should be prepared for extreme competition with China, but that uh, the U.S. is not going to do it the way Trump did, and we're going to focus on the international rules of the road. Uh, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, has said that China poses the most significant challenge to the, uh, the U.S. internationally, and uh, he's had um, some uh, exchanges with China, has already been sort of making public pronouncements uh, that are uh, sort of uh, uh, more aggressive, sort of saying, I've made clear to the, to the Chinese representative that the U.S. will defend our national interests and hold Beijing accountable for its abuses of the international system. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, has said that, uh, has framed it in terms of a sort of rivalry for uh, the legitimacy of governance approach or model. Uh, he said China is essentially making the case that their model is better than the American model and pointing to dysfunction in the U.S. and saying uh, their system doesn't work and ours does. And he's talked about how you know, the sort of building blocks of doing, a, uh, of, of fighting back against that is to uh, refurbish the fundamentals of democracy, work with allies, and invest in uh, the American system, the economy, and in tech technological development, that sort of thing. And so, so we're getting uh, some sense of the basics of the approach. Uh, the, the tension points between U.S. and China are, are going to be uh, very wide-ranging, right? Many of them are ones that exist, have existed for a long time, but we're seeing a sharpening in a lot of other areas. Uh, and so, uh, just to list a few of these things, uh, how will the Biden administration deal with the turmoil in Hong Kong in the aftermath of the national security law that was passed this last summer? Uh, the, the U.S. government is now calling um, the, what's going on in Xinjiang a genocide, and how will uh, the Biden administration uh, deal with that? Uh, how will the administration handle the South China Sea and 
China's continuing efforts to uh, establish jurisdiction uh, there. Um, how will uh, the U.S. deal with China's engagement with international organizations, uh, which I think Cal will talk about a bit. Uh, other issues like China's uh, uh, sort of influence and interference in for, you know, the affairs of other countries and using economic and other forms of coercion, that will be an issue. Uh, cybersecurity and climate change are, are sort of, it's just a, a part of the list and there are many, uh, many more uh, issues. Um, so what has uh, China said so far? China has uh, been trying to lay some initial volleys towards the Biden administration, and they've framed it in terms of uh, using the language of sort of uh, diversity and uh, sort of the Western powers uh, should not be too arrogant, these types of things, and, and think that ideologically their model is the best. And it's all in the name of the, the line, which is it's sort of new language for a line that is uh, pretty familiar for people who follow uh, Chinese foreign affairs, which is to say, uh, look, the way we do things is the way we do it. Uh, we sh that should be respected in the name of sovereignty. Uh, the new terms are sort of diversity and, and saying that it's uh, sort of arrogance to criticize uh, uh, China. Uh, and uh, officials have also talked about red lines, sort of said that they're, they're willing to cooperate with the U.S. on things like trade and climate, but the, there are red lines, things that should not be touched, like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang. Um, and so, so that's the sort of backdrop, and, um, and we'll see how the Biden administration proceeds in the face of all these issues. On, on the issue of uh, environment and climate change, uh, that uh, area has always been thought of one that's more of a bright spot in the relationship. Even uh, before, in past administrations, it's always been thought that's an area for more cooperation and relationship building, even among all of these other areas that are uh, somewhat uh, tense. And so I think there's a thought that that will still be true and a lot of talk about cooperation, but everyone is sort of wondering and debating whether it's still possible given the rising tensions and concerns about uh, China's uh, rise. So um, on uh, climate, Biden has taken a very aggressive approach right out of the, the gate. Uh, his appointments reflect a tremendous amount of really unprecedented level of climate expertise all across the government. So in the traditional environmental areas like EPA and uh, interior, but also uh, sort of climate expertise in, in defense, national security, uh, homeland security, uh, uh, the treasury, uh, you know, economic policy, energy, transportation, and so on, agriculture. And, and so uh, that's uh, the approach that uh, the Biden administration will take. They, and they've also most notably appointed uh, John Kerry as the first ever American cabinet level special envoy, special presidential envoy on climate change. And he will uh, sort of be the uh, presidential, sort of the administration's representative abroad on climate change. And so that's raised issues with China as well. Obviously, China, US and China together account for almost half of global emissions. Uh, China at about 30%, uh, um, US uh, somewhere between 10 and 15%. Um, and so the two countries need to work, uh, need to do something in order to solve uh, climate change. So there's uh, discussion whether cooperation is possible. Cooperation fame is sort of, between the US and China is credited with helping get the Paris Agreement to the finish line. And so uh, people are interested in whether that possibility still exists. But there's already been a, de a debate in Washington as to whether uh, John Kerry or the administration's interest in cooperating on climate change will be uh, a reason the administration would then be soft on China in the other areas. So that's been some some volleys out in the sort of op-ed or the think tank community, uh, leading John Kerry actually to respond explicitly to those in press conference saying, you know, we will not uh, do that. And so that's part of the U.S. political uh, dynamic, as well as the international dynamic, because the Chinese side has been explicit in saying that uh, don't expect to cooperate if you're going to interfere in these these red line areas. So. So that sort of debate is going on and we'll, we'll see how it, it goes. But I think we also, it's important to keep in mind that we are at a different stage. You know, cooperation was particularly important to help get uh, us to the Paris Agreement, but we are at a stage in which each country really just has a lot of work to do sort of domestically to get climate change done. And it'll be interesting to, a lot of the countries will just need to make sure that they're able to live up to their pledges at home. 
cooperation will still be important if it, it's possible, but it's uh, it's sort of plays a different role than it once was. And um, I, I would argue that that competition in a couple of areas, uh, if, if you think of U.S. and China competing on the economy, on sort of their status among uh, the developed uh, the developing world and for allies in, in the developing world, and as well as sort of this reputational competition, who whose system is the, the better one or more legitimate. I think all of these things have the, the potential to drive a competition that plays in favor of uh, climate change. And I think that, that may be particularly so within China where the regulatory scheme is quite top down anyway. You might imagine these uh, international factors affecting what leaders do to sort of send signals to drive enforcement campaigns or more resources being put into uh, making sure that their initiatives don't look like greenwashing, which uh, many critics accuse them of, of, of doing right now. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop right there, Jess. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Professor Wang. Uh, Professor Rastiello, welcome. Would you like to make some opening remarks? Yes, thanks and my apologies for, for coming on late. So I was asked to talk about the United Nations and kind of international organizations generally. And knowing that I missed the other comments, I'm gonna keep mine brief so I don't replicate anything and we can come back in the, in the Q&A. But I think the basic, a couple of basic points to make about the Biden administration and the UN to start there. First of all, the approach to the UN is gonna be very familiar to those of us who paid attention during the Obama years. Not going to expect to see huge differences in the campaign uh, to the degree that this topic ever came up. Biden indicated uh, a preference for a kind of return to normalcy, uh, and that was largely for him, I think, defined by what he saw during the Obama years in, in broad brushstrokes, uh, as opposed to to Trump, which uh, the Trump administration, which obviously took a very hostile stance, as Republicans often do towards the United Nations, but in particular, withdrawing from various international organizations. We've already announced, I think it was this morning, uh, Tony Blinken announced our return to the Human Rights Council as a kind of observer. Uh, and we're gonna see other returns, WHO, uh, Paris was just mentioned. Uh, there's already skirmishing around JCPOA, the Iran deal. So these are all sort of outside the direct realm of the UN, but they evidence a generalized desire to show that the United States is back as a multilateral player with respect for the notion of multilateralism as a way to generally cooperate in the world. I don't want to overstate that because Democratic presidents in recent times have, as their Republican uh, partners have, certainly shown a desire and an inclination at times to, to go their own way on things and to use their power uh, unilaterally if need be. But there's certainly a difference between what the Trump administration did and what the Biden administration will do with regard to the UN. And maybe that's, that's highlighted most strongly with uh, the choice of ambassador. So if we just look at that as a kind of symbol of the approach and the general attitude, uh, Trump started off with um, Nikki Haley, um, who had no real experience in international affairs, but for a minor level. Uh, it only went downhill from there. Biden has brought in um, Linda Thomas-Greenfield as his choice. Uh, I'll say I had a brief interaction with her about a year ago. I was on a panel with her at the State Department. At that point, obviously, she was not in any way being considered for this role, or this was so, this was literally a year ago, exactly. And I was very impressed with her, and she's a lifelong foreign service officer, someone who rose up through the ranks of the State Department with a deep understanding of the work of the State Department and a belief in the importance of day-to-day -day diplomacy. So not someone who's simply another political appointee, let alone a donor, which is really an unprecedented way to go about putting someone uh, in charge of, of the U.S. presence at the United Nations, but someone who really understands the State Department, in particular who understands Africa, uh, so she both served extensively in Africa, was ambassador to Liberia, uh, and was assistant secretary of state uh, for African affairs. So she has a deep interest in and experience with Africa, which is a, a region of the world that for the United Nations looms pretty large. Um, we tend not to focus on it as much uh, from a U.S. kind of U.S.-U.N. point of view or, you know, maybe average U.S. kind of uh, newspaper coverage doesn't emphasize it because in the Security Council, it's only coming up uh, generally as a place where peacekeeping missions are going and so forth. That's a very important part of the, of the Africa-UN interface. 
But of course, it's much broader than that. And there are so many things that the UN is doing within Africa and so many African states um, interacting at the UN level that, that this will be an important part of the future. And so she's, a, she's I think, a very good choice. I was personally impressed with her when, when I spent a few hours with her. Uh, and I think she'll, she'll come in with a seriousness of purpose that we did not see in the past. So, so that's at a you know, very kind of nuts and bolts level. Uh, in terms of the things that have changed, I think um, Alex just discussed one of the most important issues of change, which is uh, the US-China relationship. And the fact that within not only the United Nations, but other international bodies, China has been uh, a growing player for at least two decades, but has taken advantage of the last few years to really emphasize uh, its importance, its position, its strength, um, to fill the vacuum in essence that the United States left over the last four years. And that's equally true within the UN. So um, like China, we have a permanent seat and a veto on the Security Council. We've always had that and we always will. That gives us a certain uh, degree of permanent power there. But traditionally, China was a relatively quiet player on the Security Council and within the UN generally, and Chinese nationals did not fill a lot of positions within the UN. More and more that is the case. There are many more Chinese nationals within the UN today, and China is more assertive and more willing to partner often with Russia in ways we do not like, uh, generally speaking. Uh, at least this administration, this Biden administration does not like um, but also just generally, China is more active and assertive. And so that balance um, will, um, will be a challenge for the Biden administration. How do we cooperate with China in many of the ways that Alex just spoke of, while at the same time opposing China on issues we really do care about that fall within the ambit of the UN, especially in the realm of human rights, but not only in the realm of human rights. And then in addition, um, kind of in a more macro sense, to what degree will China begin to, it's already begun, but continue to redefine the rules of the road globally in terms of how we think about global governance and international law. So we basically for, uh, for about a century have had a pretty European dominated international legal system and system of global governance in which it's not only dominated by European powers, uh, but grows out of a European tradition. And with the center of political and economic gravity being in Asia, that is going to change. And it's already changing. And so that's beyond on the Biden administration, even if it's eight years of, of Joe Biden as president. Um, but that's the future that the US will have to engage with. What is our place in a world that's much more multipolar? And so we will continue to, uh, to face that challenge. So I think in terms of, uh, of policies and articulated positions, we can expect a lot of continuity uh, with what we saw during the Obama years. Um, Biden has not spoken a lot about the UN uh, to date. He did not in the campaign bring it up, uh, I think almost ever. Um, he focused on things like, of course, COVID and the economy and getting Donald Trump out. Um, so we have to infer more from his behavior in the past as vice president and as a senator and also the kind of people he's put in to positions of power. Uh, but those that he has put in, Jake Sullivan, Tony Blinken, et cetera, all are sort of straightforward, non-bomb thrower believers in the power of multilateralism and the importance of US power within a multilateral framework. So, um, so that's not very exciting, but that's the reality of, I think, what we're likely to expect. So why don't I stop there? And Great. I think I'm the last one and we'll open it up. Too. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Rostiala. Uh, Professor Bali, I'm going to turn things over to you and ask you to pick up on something that Cal just mentioned, which is the JCPOA and the Iran nuclear deal, and also to respond to a couple of the questions in the chat that relate to relations in the Middle East. Terrific. Thanks so much. Um, sure, I'll just briefly say something about the JCPOA and then turn to the broader Middle East. And I've noted questions from Anthony Norton, Professor Joe Berra, Christine Harutyunyan, and Karen Pally that were addressed to me on that, and so I'll try to, you know, quickly go through the panoply of questions that have been raised. On the JCPOA, of course, as everyone knows, this was the uh, Iran nuclear deal from which the U.S. withdrew in 2018, withdrew and then imposed a series of additional sanctions on Iran, notwithstanding, at the time, Iran's compliance. Iran has responded over time with staggered and reversible moves, increasing their enrichment levels to 20%, starting activities related to uranium metal production. 
Uh, and Iran has been tipped into a recession that's quite severe. It's in its third straight year now, and their uh, pandemic response has also been hobbled as a consequence of sanctions. So from the Iranian perspective, sanctions relief is an enormous priority. Um, and the Biden administration has already suggested that a return to the JCPOA is in the cards. However, it would require Iran reversing all the measures it's taken, and everything I just described could be reversed in a two to three month period to return Iran to full compliance on the nuclear front, but there hasn't been a suggestion from the Biden administration of the kinds of additional demands that the Trump administration was um, making. So for example, the Trump administration wanted to renegotiate a completely new deal that would add to the nuclear file also Iran's ballistic missile program, its regional power projection. Nothing that we've heard from the Biden administration suggests that these kinds of additional conditions will be placed. If Iran reverses the measures it's taken, it appears that the Biden administration will move in the direction of rejoining the RC uh, the JCPOA and might go beyond that. So for example, there's a question of support for an Iranian request for an IMF loan to address uh, the humanitarian crisis the pandemic has generated and the European Union supports that request. One might imagine that beyond sanctions relief, uh, the sort of opposition to that kind of a move from the IMF might be lifted as well. And another important thing um, to look at from the Biden administration connects to what Professor Rastiello was just talking about. You can really tell the direction the administration is going in by the appointments that it's made. And I don't mean this only with respect to the Iran envoy, but certainly with respect to the Iran envoy. Rob Malley is an incredible um, seasoned Middle East expert, was involved in the original negotiations for the JCPOA, and has now been tasked with leading the team that will be dealing with this question going forward in Iran more generally, but also William Burns, another architect of the JCPOA, is now serving as the head of the CIA. Jake Sullivan, who was just mentioned, also very involved with the JCPOA, is now the national security advisor. So while I agree entirely with Professor Steinberg that we're not going to see a general reversion to the Obama administration under Biden on a whole host of fronts, in this particular case, the Obama team does seem to be reassembled in many respects. And so I do think we should expect to see uh, a reinitiation of JCPOA talks and a broader sort of um, willingness to rethink the maximum pressure campaign that the Trump administration had adopted with respect to Iran. Now to the questions from the Q&A. Um, one question was on Turkey, and let me just say that I think the Biden administration um, is going to certainly shift to a posture that perhaps charitably be, could be called containment. So Turkey is hardly to be considered an ally at the moment to the United States, given the many kinds of moves that it's made. The human rights question was put in uh, the question, but there's much more to say than that. The purchase of a missile system from Russia, the opposition to American policies in Syria, I mean, all kinds of things mean that there, and, and Turkey's posture in the Eastern Mediterranean with respect to energy exploration also sets it at odds with the European Union. I don't expect there'll be pressure to push Turkey out of NATO, but I do think that the main posture will be one of containing the kinds of threats that Turkey now poses to various kinds of U.S. interests. And that, of course, is extraordinarily different than the Trump administration, which had, had very friendly relations with President Erdogan and looked the other way largely on most of these kinds of questions with respect to Turkey. Um, then there was a broader question about what might the U.S. do in general about the rollback of human rights that are a consequence of Turkish actions, Russian actions, other actions. And I think here it's going to be a little more challenging. I outlined a whole host of steps that I think the Biden administration should take with respect to human rights, and all of those will help restore American standing. But the United States has lost a lot of leverage in talking about human rights as a consequence of the Trump administration's actions. And in the case of actors like Turkey and Russia, the same could be said of the European Union, which in the face of the 2015 refugee crisis, largely as a consequence of um, events in Syria, negotiated a side deal with President Erdogan to basically warehouse people to prevent them from accessing Europe. That is not a rights enhancing posture, nor does it really live up to the kinds of commitments the European Union purports to stand for. And Turkey is well aware of that and makes this point repeatedly. And more importantly, perhaps in the government, there's real resonance in that argument that these are double standards, that the Western powers themselves have abandoned the protection of human rights at, at home in a variety of respects, but certainly in their foreign policies publics in Turkey, but in, in also much of the Middle East, actually um, agree with those views. And so the ability to have American policy overnight alter the landscape for human rights abuses um, will be difficult. I think the best place to begin is at home, to stop and reverse those steps that the Trump administration took that imperiled international human rights, and then work from there, building relationships again or rebuilding relationships with allies, with international mechanisms in an attempt to bolster the system. There were also a host of questions about whether we can expect the United States to continue specific areas of policy, for example, 
um, treatment of friends versus adversaries with respect to double standards and human rights. I think we do see very positive steps from Biden administration at the moment. For example, pressure that's being brought to bear on Saudi Arabia, traditionally an authoritarian ally of the United States, to desist from its intervention in Yemen and to rethink its posture with respect to uh, this enormous humanitarian crisis. I think that's very good. The fact that the um, Biden administration has also revisited some aspects of the Trump administration's policies towards Israel is notable. So for example, the Abraham Accords had many positive features, but they did also entail massive arms sales to the United Arab Emirates um, and other Gulf actors. And those arms sales are now being um, questioned and revisited. There was also uh, a point made, I believe, in the questions about Morocco and Western Sahara's sovereignty. Here again, I think there are indications that the Biden administration might revisit this question. This was a clear violation of international law standards. There's a UN framework in place that does not recognize Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. That is an occupation, that status is one of a frozen conflict to be resolved through international law, and the Sahrawis have a right of sovereignty and self-determination, all of which were trampled on by the Trump administration's recognition of Moroccan annexation of Western Sahara in exchange for normalization of relations with Israel. That looks like something that might get revisited by the Biden administration. Another example of not necessarily always favoring uh, authoritarian allies when it comes to human rights, which is good news, but in general, I would say, in response to Professor Barra's question, that we shouldn't expect a full reversal. I think the United States pattern of looking the other way and even immunizing key allies from human rights criticism while using human rights registers to go after adversaries is a very longstanding uh, tradition in American diplomacy and will likely uh, survive into this administration as well. And finally, there were a host of questions on Israel. Let me just say, again here that there are lots of indications that while the Biden administration will continue very significant levels of support for the Israeli government, as all American administrations have, that they will retreat from some of the positions taken by the Trump administration. Just to give some examples, first of all, they've appointed an envoy on Israeli-Palestinian affairs, Amr Hadi, who was also involved um, as a deputy secretary under the Obama administration and now will be U.S. Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Israeli-Palestinian Affairs. And one of his first actions was to resume um, diplomatic relations with the Palestinian Authority. So that's an important step forward. I think that much more could be done. For example, just as with Western Sahara, the Trump administration's recognition of the annexation of the Golan Heights is deeply problematic, flies in the teeth of standing international law and the existing UN Security Council resolutions and ought to be revisited as well. But there's reason for us to think at this stage that while the Biden administration will persist in its support, in traditional U.S. support for uh, the Israeli state, that the steps that were taken by the Trump administration that were departures, significant departures from a U.S. commitment to a two-state solution, will see some backtracking on those, uh, which will mean that there'll be some degree of, um, let's say, restraint imposed on what either the Netanyahu government or if Prime Minister Netanyahu is challenged internally, another domestic regime in Israel can expect um, to be able to get away with at the international level. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor Bali. Um, Professor Steinberg, if I could turn back to you, I, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about the US relationship with the International Criminal Court and drawing on a couple of questions in the chat from Thomas Butler and Anthony Norton, which hopefully they'll forgive me for paraphrasing. Could you talk a little bit about the executive order and also how the recent decision on Palestine on Friday might affect the US relationship with the ICC? Yeah, so the United States has um, long had a um, mixed relationship with the ICC. We are not a state party of the ICC, um, but we have uh, engaged in constructive engagement. That is where uh, our interests dovetail with uh, investigations and prosecutions undertaken by the ICC. We have cooperated uh, with some intensity, providing signal intelligence, satellite uh, imagery, uh, in some cases, boots on the ground trying to find uh, Joseph Kony and the like. That, that policy of constructive engagement was abandoned by the Trump administration, which was uh, highly critical, particularly when John Bolton was a member of the administration, highly critical of the ICC, and um, uh, uh, culminated in an executive order uh, issued by President Trump imposing sanctions on the prosecutor property sanctions and um, uh, visa sanctions on the prosecutor and the head of one of her uh, divisions. Um, and uh, also uh, prohibiting any person, including an American 
citizen from providing uh, material support or services to the prosecutor. Now, the reason for this, this is sort of was catalyzed by two investigations that were being undertaken by the prosecutor. One is of the situation in Afghanistan. Basically, uh, an element of that is uh, looking at the possibility of uh, prosecuting Americans who authorized uh, torture uh, in Afghanistan uh, in the uh, early years of our um, uh, coalition in invasion of, Af of Afghanistan. Um, and second, uh, the prosecutors wish to investigate the situation in Palestine. Um, both of those entailed um, real um, extensive claims of sovereign of, of um, jurisdiction by the court, which in the view of the United States and in the view of many um, scholars and jurists uh, is really an overreach. Uh, the, the, the argument being that they don't have the jurisdiction, the, the court doesn't have the jur jurisdiction to take on these matters. Uh, in the first case, the United States is um, not a state party to the Rome statute. Um, and uh, uh, no state asserted universal jurisdiction or said that, that uh, there were effects of US behavior uh, that uh, would warrant ICC jurisdiction. Um, and of course, the Security Council didn't ask for the jurisdiction of the court. So the prosecutor on her own um, uh, action uh, decided to uh, prosecute uh, anyway. In the case of Palestine, um, Palestine, um, the Palestinian National Authority declared itself the government of Palestine, um, purported to accede to the Rome Statute, and then uh, uh, filed a, a, a brief with the prosecutor asking the prosecutor to, take, to um, assume jurisdiction in, uh, on Palestine. It's thought that there would be at least two dimensions to the investigation in, in, in Palestine, one being uh, of the Israeli settlements uh, and whether they, violate, whether they constitute a war crime uh, under the definition set forth in the Rome Statute, and uh, the other um, uh, uh, violent attacks uh, by Hamas and uh, other, other uh, Palestinian uh, entities uh, against unarmed Israeli civilians. Uh, there, um, that, that entails, it, uh, asserting jurisdiction in that entails the prosecutor and the court deciding that, at least for purposes of the Rome Statute, Palestine is a state. Well, since the United States hasn't recognized Palestine as a state, uh, nor has uh, have many other countries, including other great powers like Russia and China, um, and because the Oslo uh, Accords uh, which were signed by the Palestinian National Authority, defer the question of Palestinian statehood. Um, it's quite a reach for a court or a prosecutor to take the decision that uh, a territory is a state uh, under international law. So in response to this, um, the uh, uh, Trump administration issued, issued this executive order. Now, there are very good reasons to be very critical of the executive order. First, um, it's illegal. It violates the First Amendment. The, uh, uh, I personally and the ICC Forum, which um, uh, operates through the law school and through the Promise Institute, and in which many law students are engaged, uh, has for 10 years collaborated with the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICC on um, addressing issues of interest to the prosecutor. On advice of counsel, we are no longer able to do that. That has a chilling effect on free speech and free press. And in fact, the Second Circuit recently decided, um, uh, reached that same conclusion. The second reason, of course, is I think most people think it's bad policy to um, uh, impose sanctions on, on the prosecutor. You know, normatively, the United States should like many of the ambitions, most of the ambitions, of the Rome Statute, we oppose genocide, we oppose crimes against humanity, oppose war crimes. Uh, and in addition, many of the investigations by the ICC advance US foreign policy interests. Um, on the other hand, these sovereignty arguments uh, and, and jurisdiction arguments are, are, are very powerful. And um, uh, the, UN, the US national security establishment is deeply concerned by, by these actions, uh, uh, both the Palestine investigation and the Afghanistan in, uh, investigation. Um, you know, we can't forget that Israel is the cornerstone of our US alliance in the Middle East. 
uh, against uh, a sort of um, uh, Russia, Iran, Syria, Hezbollah kind of uh, coalition. Um, so what will the Biden administration do? Um, well, uh, it's, it, is, it is a little difficult to predict. Uh, clearly the um, working group on the campaign on human rights unanimously recommends, uh, recommended rescission of the executive order. And if not rescission of the executive order, rescission of the designation of the prosecutor and the head of the division, uh, the JCCD D division at the ICC. Uh, but um, of course, uh, that um, uh, civil society and and uh, those within the government who who champion human rights, international criminal law, are are facing uh, concern from the national security establishment. I do think that um, uh, you know the United States has 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 lodged a complaint against the decision by the pretrial chamber last week um, authorizing the investigation in, in Palestine. Um, but I do think that um, that. Uh, the inclination of the administration, both in its desire to work with um, our allies and to work with uh, like-minded countries uh, and uh, sharing many of the goals of the ICC will, again, begin constructively engaging with the Office of the Prosecutor uh, where, where those investigations dovetail with our interests. Um, it's not impossible that we provide uh, uh, cooperation um, uh, on even the Palestine case, insofar as it goes to providing information, intelligence, satellite imagery, and the like uh, concerning um, uh, uh, Palestinian, largely Hamas, attacks on unarmed civilians. Um, uh, the policy, the executive order is, is under review. Um, uh, uh, obviously, right now, a week after the, the decision by the pretrial chamber, I don't expect an immediate uh, rescission of the executive order. Uh, but um, uh, over time, I think that's probably where the administration is headed. Thank you very much, Professor Steinberg. Um, Professor Wong, we have a, a few questions directed to you in the chat that, again, I, I hope the questioners will um Allow me to paraphrase and combine a little bit. We have questions from William sure. Chandler, Perry Bloom, and Carol Hamilton. Uh, one sort of theme of these questions is how can the US effectively confront China when uh, China uses this, this argument that things are within the internal affairs of China, particularly maybe in the context of Tibet? And then secondly, how do you expect China to respond to the Biden administration's attempts to build international coalitions aimed at countering the rise of China? Yeah, so th those are great questions. I, th I think on the the first one, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of issues that were raised in the questions, you know, and they all have their own circumstances. So Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Tibet. Um, and uh, the question is right to say that China's defense of that is often to say, look, these are internal affairs, these are red lines, these are uh, sovereign matters. Um, but I, I think it, it's going to be harder and harder for China to really claim that line as it goes out into the world and is increasingly having its own influence and, and demanding uh, sort of uh, concessions and, and changes in behavior from others, I think. And I think we've already started to see more assertive pushback on all of those issues from um, U.S. government under the Trump administration. And it seems as though Biden, uh, in this, the Biden administration is planning to continue in, the, in that vein. So um, on Xinjiang, uh, they include things like uh, naming what's going on a uh, a genocide. Um, they're uh, the part of the push to engage with the UN more. Uh, there needs to be more engagement on uh, in the human rights uh, apparatus to sort of work with other countries to um, uh, criticize and to to find ways to uh, influence uh, China's uh, behavior there. There's efforts to. Uh, apply pressure through, uh, for example, affecting uh, supply chains. A lot of Western companies are doing business uh, in Xinjiang, uh, and so putting pressure there. And uh, you're, possibly you'll see continuation along the lines of some of the legislation that's already been passed, like the uh, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, where you get these sort of Magnitsky Act-like punishments where officials engaged in the stated disfavored behaviors uh, will be uh, sanctioned in some in some way, and so you've seen that in uh, Xinjiang context, Hong Kong, and and Tibet these Magnitsky style um, um, moves, and so uh, the situation will be um, 
you've seen similar uh, attempts at, at legislation or, or similar moves to, to pass legislation in the Hong Kong uh, situation uh, and the Tibet situation, where the, the Tibet situation is dealing with the right of uh, Tibetan leaders to choose their own um, their own successors, among other things, uh, right? And um, I think particularly interesting will be to see how uh, the Biden administration deals with Taiwan. I think uh, the uh, old school diplomats have always taken a particular uh, approach focused on am ambiguity and um, Trump administration obviously broke a lot of the norms uh, on that. And uh, one question is whether we will see the Biden administration continuing in that vein in terms of uh, encouraging more engagement between U.S. and, and Taiwanese leaders, increasing arms sales, increasing economic in uh, integration, and how will the U.S. engage on Taiwan's place in the inter international world? What will the U.S., how aggressive will the U.S. be in trying to get Taiwan more active in international uh, or organizations? And so the, the world there is, looks a little bit different now, four years uh, later, and then some of these norms have been broken and um, and uh, the U.S. may be willing to continue in that in that vein. Uh, on the other question about international coalitions, um, you know, it looks like there's going to be a competition to sort of win the favor of other countries and uh, in, through development aid or other types of relationships, through trade or other, other types of things. And it wouldn't be surprising to see that countries are going to sort of take what they can get from, from either country, you know, what, what works uh, best uh, for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing to have this competition for, uh, for allies and, and the, the favor of, of other countries. Uh, the concern uh, with China getting into international development has always been that, uh, you know, for, for a long time, this fear that, you know, China will offer finance and these types of things without conditions and uh, sort of support, uh, you know, human rights uh, violations or bad labor practices and these types of things. But at, at the same time, you know, when the U.S. engaged in trying to apply conditions, uh, to uh, its support of other nations. It always hasn't uh, done the best job at that. And there's lots of examples of, of the, the U.S. Uh, uh, taking that in a, in a direction that uh, could be improved. And so that competition probably doesn't, doesn't hurt. And it just really, uh, I think, depends on the Biden administration's ability to sort of offer something that other countries uh, will find to be in their interests. Thank you, Professor Wong. Uh, Professor Rostiola, again, I'm going to combine a few of the questions that we have in the chat uh, from um, a couple of anonymous contributors and also Edward Capewell. Uh, so one strand is sort of how should the Biden administration think about using soft power versus hard power in its inter international relations? And the second is how might um, the current composition of the Supreme Court affect the way Biden develops uh, priorities in this area? Okay, interesting. So on the first one, I think we'll definitely see more attention to soft power. So soft power is conventionally defined as the idea that it's the power to attract uh, rather than to, to compel or to force. And traditionally the U.S. has had an abundance of soft power. And actually I agree with many of the things that Alex was saying about U.S.-China relations and and one area in which we continue to excel, though I suppose the current moment questions this a little bit, is in our soft power vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. China has not had a tremendous degree of success in attracting other countries to its way of life, to its way of governance. COVID, of course, scrambles this a bit, uh, and China has been touting its, its successes, uh, and maybe with some justification. So we may see some shifts in that, but this is an area of traditional strength is what, uh, what I really want to say with regard to the U.S. And while the Trump administration trampled on so many of the features that made this nation attractive to the rest of the world and has for decades, um, it's not the first time that a president has been disenchanting to others in the outside world. And of course, the outside world is very varied, but this is not the first time. And I think that American soft power continues to be there, just not in the way that it, it once did. And I think the Biden administration will try to enhance that to the degree it can. The problem is using soft power in, a, in an overt way is not very easy. Uh, so we have a history during the Cold War of, for example, sending, you know, we sent uh, jazz bands all over the world. Dizzy Gillespie was one of our ambassadors in a, in a loose sense. 
uh, going out. And at one point, Gillespie refused to go and perform as, uh, as, as, as the Little Rock crisis was taking place, saying, I'm not going to defend the United States when we won't defend our own constitution. So we have this mixed record of trying to use soft power in an overt way. Now, in fact, I think that particular episode worked to our benefit in showing that we tolerated dissent and that someone like Dizzy Gillespie could openly say to the United States, I'm not going to be your shill uh, at this particular moment in time, uh, actually was beneficial for the United States, that we could do that and the Soviet Union would never have tolerated that kind of pushback from one of its own citizens. But nonetheless, it just shows the difficulties in actually using soft power. So I think the most important point I'd like to make is, yes, we have a lot of soft power as a nation we traditionally have and continue to, but it's not something that is a tool that's very easy to deploy, that we try, we certainly try. On the second issue of, of international law in the, in the Supreme Court and elsewhere, again, this is something that the administration has limited control over, though, of course, when there are cases that raise relevant issues of international law, the U.S. will often either be a party or intervene uh, with a position. And in some areas, the U.S. position is very important. The position of the U.S. government that the Solicitor General might take is very influential. Um, it's true that Republican uh, appointed justices have traditionally been more skeptical about aspects of international law, but even Justice Scalia himself embraced certain areas of international law and was not, in fact, that critical overall. He found certain things to be problematic in particular areas of customary international law, certain ones, certainly human rights and the way that was developed in the, in the 80s and 90s troubled him in certain ways as a facet of international law. Alien tort statute is a good example where, you know, the Supreme Court has basically accepted that there is an alien tort statute and it has real meaning, but it's going to be combined, confined to certain areas uh, and that it reflects international law. So I think what we've seen over time is a, a, a right-leaning court minimize certain areas of international law, but accept others. And we've had a bit more, um, a bit more continuity than might be apparent. So I don't expect a radical change in that, but of course we have some new justices. Uh, we don't really know where they stand. They haven't really had an opportunity to speak. Uh, and the questioner is absolutely right that there is, there is a, a sort of traditional hostility that many Republican judges show to the very idea that international law should be binding on the United States in any way. And um, I don't think that's gonna go away, but it, it's not something we ought to overstate. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Cal. Um, Professor Steinberg, I'm going to turn back to you because we have a number of trade related questions in the chat. Uh, so again, I'm going to combine a few of them. Um, what are the prospects for resurrecting the transatlantic trade and investment partnership with the EU? Uh, do you think there's any prospect for a UK US foreign trade agreement and what might that look like? And what might the fate be of the WTO appellate body, given how the U.S. has sort of behaved in the appointment of judges there? That's a lot, a lot of questions that have complicated answers. Uh, and you have three minutes quickly. to address them. Right. Them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, OK, uh, Brexit. Um, the question in the Q&A function refers to the U.K. as a, a coming across as a desperate supplicant to the United States. Um, actually, you know, while um, uh, there is uh, certainly disagreement about the wisdom of Brexit from a UK perspective. Um, one advantage of Brexit is that by being freed from the customs union, uh, the UK can conclude free trade agreements uh, with uh, other countries. Um, and the most obvious country to conclude it with is the United States. Uh, and um, uh, that's because we're the world's largest market still of any single country in the world. So if Britain were to get sudden uh, duty-free access to the you know, entire U.S. market, that would help the, the, the British economy. From, from the U.S. perspective, um, well, one would expect a very, very modest uh, uh, positive net benefit to the United States. Um, and the agreement is largely concluded. Um, the texts were negotiated at the end of the Trump administration, and they're largely done. I would expect that um, if the United States were to go ahead or actually when the United States goes ahead with this agreement, because I do think we will conclude an agree uh, a, a free trade agreement with, with the UK, uh, we will strengthen provisions on labor and the, and the environment and particularly on subsidies and state enterprises. 
Uh, this is a theme that will be played out both in the TTIP context or efforts at something like that, and in the context of the WTO appellate body. Um, there is a concerted effort by, um, uh, the, by USTR and by the Biden administration to address China issues. Two huge issues are the rule of state enterprises and the extent of Chinese subsidization. And we want to bring um, our like-minded like countries on board on those policy positions and build them into uh, our trade agreements. So I would expect that the US, um, UK FTA would have uh, new disciplines on subsidies and state enterprises, and uh, any agreement done with the European Union more broadly, uh, such as the TTIP would uh, as, as well. We have big conflicts with the European Union right now that also have to be solved. Boeing, the Boeing Airbus uh, issue, uh, digital services tax, which uh, is a tax that would constitute double taxation on U.S. large technology companies. We have the old issues of agriculture with the European Union, so concluding a, an agreement like this with the European Union is very difficult. We've tried to conclude a, uh, a free trade agreement of one sort or another with the European Union for over 30 years, and it's always proven difficult. I would expect that we would make progress on a few issues uh, and conclude a trade uh, and investment agreement that's not complete liberalization of uh, all sectors of trade or, uh, uh, or investment. WTO appellate body, there's no way I can cover it in, in, in the remaining time. I will just say that um, I don't think the revival of the WTO appellate body will be easy or that it'll happen quickly. Thank you very much, Professor Steinberg. And thank you very much to all of our panelists. We're right at time. I'm so sorry we didn't get to all of the questions in the chat, but thank you so much for coming and for uh, engaging with us with your questions. We really enjoyed this event and we hope that you did too. Thank you so much.